Good afternoon once again, everyone. This is the mission science briefing for the Juno spacecraft being launched on Friday morning aboard an Atlas rocket. We'll begin with Scott Bolton, the Juno principal investigator from the Southwest Research Institute in San Antonio. Next, we will hear from Toby Owen, the Juno co-investigator from the University of Hawaii. Jack Connerney, the Juno MAG instrument lead from Goddard Space Flight Center. Steve Levin, the Juno project scientist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Fran Baganaw, the Juno co-investigator from the University of Colorado at Boulder. And Candy Hansen, the Juno co-investigator from the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson. And we'll begin now with our principal investigator, Scott Bolton. Scott? Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for having me here. It's very exciting. We're just uh, two days away from launching Juno, uh, and we head off to Jupiter. We go into polar orbit around Jupiter, and uh, what we're really going after is some of the most fundamental questions of, uh, of our solar system. How Jupiter formed, how it evolved, what really happened early in the solar system that eventually led to all of us and the terrestrial planets and the Earth. And these are really basic questions. Who are we? Where did we come from? How did we get here? We go back to Jupiter because it's, it's the most massive and the largest of all the planets. And so after the Sun formed, uh, Jupiter actually got most of the leftovers. If you take everything in the solar system, it fits inside Jupiter, everything else other than the Sun. And you take all of this, and, it, and it's still twice as massive as everything else. And so when we're looking at that history, trying to understand what happened in the early solar system, and what were the elements, what, were, what state were they in, how were they distributed, um, you really go back to Jupiter, it's kind of like this time capsule. Because of its size, it got most of the leftovers, so we know that whatever happened after the sun is recorded in Jupiter, and because of its um, giant gravity field, it's been able to hold on to that material, unlike the Earth, which has lost a lot of its original material. So it's, it's a great place for us to go back and get that first step after the solar system first formed, the sun forms, what happens that allows the planets to form a little bit different than the sun, and, it's, and this composition, we're kind of going after this recipe of how planets are made, we're back at the ingredient list. We're getting the ingredients of Jupiter. We're going to understand what the structure is like inside, how is it built, and that'll kind of give us guidance as to what happened in that early time that eventually led to us. So uh, let me get the first uh, image, which is a Cassini image of uh, Jupiter. And you see the beautiful zones and belts in the red spot there. This is taken by Cassini as it flew by Jupiter, which uh, coincidentally is a, about the time that we sort of put together some of the ideas that eventually led to the Juno mission. And uh, behind those clouds are some of the secrets for our early solar system. We have three different techniques that try to see inside that planet. One is the gravity field. And another is the magnetic field. Those are two invisible force fields. We have special instruments that go down and look in deep uh, at Jupiter. The other is a microwave experiment that looks at thermal emission coming from the atmosphere. But beneath those clouds that you see, we're going to see down deep, and we're going to go after the water abundance there, which is one of the key discriminators for us to understand how Jupiter formed. It basically tells us about the oxygen. Oxygen is a fundamental element to us. Not only does it help us with life as we know it, you know, the search for water is sort of the search for life, but in fact oxygen is the third most abundant element in the universe, and so it's, it's a very important element to understand after hydrogen and helium being the most abundant elements. So we don't really know that about Jupiter, and that's one of the key pieces of information that we need to unravel these mysteries. So I have an animation that just shows uh, the Juno. Uh, approaching Earth, you see, I mean, approaching Jupiter, you see our uh, solar arrays. They're huge. Each one's about eight and a half meters long. Um, it's a giant spacecraft. On the end of one of those is the magnetometer boom. We cartwheel through space twice per minute. This is how we spin. Um, when we get to Jupiter, we go into polar orbit. Uh, 
not just any polar orb, but we go really close to the planet. This is what enables our science. We get special instruments in a special vantage point, and that's how we're going to uh, accomplish our objectives. We go into a very close polar orbit, only about 5,000 kilometers above the cloud tops, a close approach. We orbit 30 times. Each time, is, uh, each time we orbit, we've carefully orchestrated this so that it passes through a different longitude. And at the end of the 30 orbits, we've essentially dropped a net around the planet with all of our measurements. And that's what gives us both latitudinal and, la and longitudinal coverage. Very important for understanding these, these invisible force fields. That polar orbit also turns out to be uh, perfect to understand the polar magnetosphere and the, and the uh, incredibly strong aurora that are at Jupiter. Jupiter has the most powerful aurora in the solar system. They're virtually unexplored. The previous missions like Galileo have only been able to go around near the equator. We'll go over the poles, we'll go right over those aurora, and, uh, and we'll learn quite a bit about those and be able to compare that back to what we know, how aurora work on the Earth and at Saturn, which is uh, we're learning from Cassini. So uh, in a few minutes, in the next uh, talks, you'll hear from my colleagues about the details of some of these uh, observations that we're going to make in our science objectives. And at the end, uh, you'll also hear from uh, my colleague Candy Hansen, who will tell you about our JunoCam, our camera, which is uh, dedicated to public outreach and education. And so I'm very excited about that part of the, of the mission. We'll get the first pictures of the poles, and uh, we're all curious to see what those look like, especially after the surprises that Cassini showed us at Saturn. So back to you, George. All right. Thank you, Scott. And now to Toby Owen, the Juno co-investigator from the University of Hawaii. Toby. Thank you. I'd like to pick up uh, some of the things that Scott was talking about, um, starting with uh, the big question. Uh, you have to think of our ancient ancestors standing out under the great big sky, dark night, seeing those stars, and wondering if there's any connection between those stars and themselves. And this is such a big question that it has still, it still influences the things that happen here on Earth. It's had an influence on religions all around the planet. It has inspired art, architecture, literature. And it has created a number of wonderful arguments among scientists as to what really was going on. So we're going to present some views to you. Um, many of them are not true, but we don't know that yet. So you come back and uh, talk to us after we've been to, Ju to Jupiter. We may have some very different things to say. So how do we believe we got to Jupiter? Our idea can be uh, started with the first image, which tells us something about what's out there among the stars. And for our purposes, the interesting <laughs> things are the gases. And you see here illuminated by their own emissions and the dust, which is the dark material there. So we've got da gas and dust out in the interstellar medium. A fragment of one of those clouds condensed. It spun up and made a disk. And the planets formed within that disk. And we're going to be looking at the biggest of those in our solar system, which is Jupiter. Now, there are some small planets that formed as well. And I think that's illustrated in the next image, if we can have that, please. No, I'm sorry. This is how we get, this is after we get down to the planet stage, we get to the Earth and we see things like this, okay? So our, our problem, our challenge is to get from out there in interstellar space down to Botticelli. And it's a big job and we haven't done it yet, but we're going to show you how we get there, how we might get there. So here's the solar system as we see it. And if you were looking at the solar system from Alpha Centauri, for example, a nearby star, what you would see would be the sun, four planets, and some debris. Okay, we're down in the debris. So it's like being an archaeologist and you're surrounded by chips and pieces of marble, some pots, and you're trying to figure out where they came from, what kind of a civilization produced them. And we're sort of in that situation with Jupiter. We, with the solar system, I should say, we're in the debris, those chip bits and pieces, and the reason we want to go to Jupiter, as Scott said, is that it should have, should have preserved the original material from that disk, from that solar nebula, as we call it, 
And so if we can study Jupiter, we have a chance of getting back in time and looking at conditions, composition that existed then. So what, what do we find? Um, the interesting part, Scott has mentioned, is that because Jupiter is so large, it has collected the gas and dust from that original cloud. We think the way it formed is that it began with a big solid object, which we would call a super Earth, say, about 10 Earth masses or so. And it got big enough so it could attract the surrounding material, the gases and the dust, and that formed the huge atmosphere that we see today. That's our model for what could have happened. And we want to test that model with the observations that we can make, some of them right now with Juno. So one of the key observations is going to be to look for oxygen, as Scott has mentioned. The oxygen on Jupiter is going to combine with the hydrogen and make water, our famous H2O. So it's the water that we're really after. And as Scott said, we've got to get below those clouds to see it, the visible clouds, the one we see from Earth. Because down below, there are going to be water clouds. There may even be rain. That's where the oxygen is. To find that oxygen, we have to use radiation from the interior. We're going to hear more of that later. We look at that radiation in the spectrum, and in it, we're going to see an absorption, which is caused by the water. By measuring that absorption, we can derive the abundance of water, and that gives us the oxygen. That's important, very important, for a number of different reasons. One of them is that oxygen is missing in our observations of Jupiter so far. We see a little bit of it in the water vapor uh, up above the clouds that our probe was able to uh, detect. But the big amount in the clouds I'm talking to, about, talk to you about, the water clouds, we don't, we don't know. We will know after Juno. So then we will have nitrogen, which we already know, carbon, and finally oxygen. So those three, with the hydrogen, are the big four in the universe. We see them everywhere, in all the stars, the distant galaxies. Now we've got them on Jupiter, and we can compare Jupiter's composition with that of the Sun, a nice star nearby. We think that if things happen the way I've described to you, Jupiter ought to have the same composition as the Sun. They both formed out of the same solar nebula. Jupiter's big enough, so the stuff it attracted should be the original unmodified solar material, solar nebula material. But it isn't. That's one of the interesting surprises that the Galileo probe gave us. Some of the heavy elements, carbon and nitrogen in particular, are enriched in Jupiter's atmosphere above the level that they have in the sun. Oxygen may or may not be, and that's one of the reasons we're so anxious to find it. If oxygen is more abundant in Jupiter's atmosphere than the carbon and the nitrogen, we have to figure out how it got that way. And the reason would be, we think, is that Jupiter formed farther out in the solar system instead of where we find it today. <coughs> because out around Uranus and Neptune, it's going to collect much more ice, meaning more water, meaning more oxygen. So we would see a much higher abundance of oxygen than the carbon and nitrogen. If Jupiter formed where it is today, then the oxygen and carbon and nitrogen should all have pretty nearly the same amount, same abundance. If, on the other hand, the oxygen is lower than carbon and nitrogen, then we would expect that the, car that the oxygen has combined with silicon to make rocks. The rocks would have settled out and joined that big mass, the 10 Earth mass, in the core, in, in making a core. We don't know if that happened. But we have an experiment, the gravity experiment, which will tell us, <coughs> may tell us about a concentration of matter at the center. If we also have this information from the oxygen about the formation of rocks, then we'll be pretty much zooming in on the fact that Jupiter has a core. And this will be a very important result because that will tell us that this model for making Jupiter from a, starting from a 10 Earth mass object is probably right. But that's not all oxygen will do for us. We need to know the interior of Jupiter, how it's formed, the different layers. And in order to do that, we need to know the oxygen abundance because it's the third most element, third most abundant element in the universe. And so it's going to be a key component of putting this giant planet together. So far, we haven't had it. That means our models to date are inadequate 
at some level. We don't know how much because we don't know how much oxygen there is. But that's another major uh, advantage that uh, this particular element is going to give us once we get those numbers. So let me stop there and turn it back to George. All right. Thank you, Toby. Now to Jack Kinerney, the Juno Mag Instrument lead from Goddard Space Flight Center. Jack. Thank you, George. <clears throat> now we have two ways uh, to probe the deep interior uh, of the planet. One is to study the planet's gravitational field, and the other is to study its magnetic field. Um, if I could have the first uh, video clip, we'll look uh, down inside Jupiter, uh, beneath the colorful but thin cloud layer. Uh, you have a helium and hydrogen, largely hydrogen atmosphere of increasing pressure and density. By the time you get about a quarter of the way down to the center of the planet, the pressure is so great that the electrons squeeze off of the atoms and it becomes a metallic conductor. It transitions to a, a metallic hydrogen state. And that's a very good electrical conductor. And then in the very center, you may have seen the, uh, the inner core that Toby was talking about that may have as much as 15 Earth masses in heavy elements. So uh, how do we measure the uh, gravitational field? Well, we have a, an experiment, or actually we have a, a subsystem on the spacecraft, the telecom system, that does that for us. If we can have the next clip, the, uh, the spacecraft communicates with a dish on Earth, and receives a radio signal to receive commands, and it sends a radio signal back. Those two, you see in the bottom of this graphic, align perfectly if there's no differential gravitation acceleration. But as the spacecraft travels over the surface, it feels a lesser or greater gravitational acceleration, and those two signals come out of alignment. By studying those signals, we can, or the science team, can infer the distribution of mass throughout the entire planet. And that's one of the puzzle pieces that we have to put together, along with the composition that Toby mentioned, uh, to figure out what the interior state of the planet looks like. So we have, a, we have another way to probe the deep interior, and that's by studying the magnetic field. We've learned over the past uh, four or five decades that, uh, by and large, with few exceptions, all the planets have magnetic fields much like the Earth's. And Jupiter, being a very large planet, uh, has a very, very large magnetic field. It's about 20,000 times the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. We have a clip uh, here to show you what the magnetic field would look like if we, could, uh, if we could color the magnetic field lines with light. And you see the, uh, the bright aurora on the northern and southern hemisphere, and my colleague, uh, friend Bagan, and I will talk about that in a minute. But uh, it's not surprising, as large as Jupiter is, and as short as, as the Jupiter uh, day is, only 10 hours of the rotation period, that it has an enormous magnetic field. Uh, Jupiter is so large, however, that the magnetic field on the surface is only about 20 times as intense as the magnetic field on the Earth's surface. Uh, but even so, uh, Juno, in its orbit about Jupiter, will traverse uh, a, a magnetic field that's about 10 times more intense than any spacecraft uh, launch previously has experienced. And so for that very reason, we've tested some of the uh, spacecraft uh, components to make sure they function in that environment. Um, okay, uh, if we could have the, uh, the next clip. Um, this is uh, how we measure the magnetic field. You may have noticed at the outer end of Jupiter's uh, very large solar arrays, we have an appendage, this A-shaped appendage. At the very outer end of that is a suite of instruments, a fluxgate magnetometer. And you see light baffles there peeking through the, uh, the thermal blanket. And they define the field of view of two cameras that fly with each of the magnetic field sensors. Those cameras take a, a picture of the stars. And by comparing that image with a catalog of known stars, we can determine the attitude of these sensors, the orientation of these sensors in space with great accuracy. And so that's part of the reason why this uh, uh, Juno spacecraft is carrying the most capable uh, magnetic field investigation that we've ever launched. Now, hopefully, uh, you know, when, we, uh, <laughs> when we are able to get observations around the entire planet, uh, as it's illustrated in the next clip, we'll be able to image uh, Jupiter's dynamo with a clarity that, uh, that will be unprecedented. 
You see here the successive orbits being laid down by the Juno spacecraft. And by the time we're done, we will have established a dense net of observations completely encircling the planet and separated by only about 12 degrees in longitude. This is one of the, uh, the unique features of the Juno mission. We orbit pole to pole. Previous missions were largely confined to the equator plane where the satellites, uh, the moons of Jupiter, are located because they wanted to rendezvous with these moons. We're the first mission to uh, essentially sample the entire three dimensions of volume around Jupiter, and this gives us the ability to resolve what the magnetic field looks like down at the surface of the dynamo with, uh, with an unprecedented clarity. <laughs> That's it for gravity and magnetic, George. Thank you, Jack. Steve Levin is the Juno project scientist from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. Steve. Hi, uh, why don't we start with that uh, first animation. What you, what you see when you look at Jupiter is basically the tops of Jupiter's enormous dynamic atmosphere. And we can take a look at that and we can see with our infrared cameras, for example, or visible light, uh, we can see a lot about the weather and the motions that are going on in Jupiter's atmosphere. But when you look at these structures, these enormous belts and zones that you can see moving in the animation or the uh, storms like the giant red spot that's twice as big as the entire Earth, there's a lot going on in Jupiter's atmosphere that we'd like to understand in greater depth. And what we're seeing with, that, with previous measurements and with visible light and with our infrared camera is the top of that atmosphere. In order to understand what's deep inside the atmosphere, we need to probe further. If you go to that first slide, the, that one, for example, the belts and zones are enormous jet streams that encircle the planet, but we don't know how deep they go. This just shows an artist's conception of two possibilities. They could be relatively shallow or they could go quite deep, and that would have a big effect on our understanding of how they work. So, what we need to do is probe deep into the atmosphere, and if you look at the next slide, it shows how we're going to do that with the microwave receiver on Juno. And basically what MWR, the microwave receiver, does is it has six different channels, so we can look into the atmosphere with six different frequencies, and we look at the natural radio emission from Jupiter. Everything gives off uh, radiation, depending on the temperature, Different, uh, hotter temperature gives off more radiation. The amount of radio waves we get from Jupiter depend on its temperature because Jupiter is hotter on the inside than the outside since it's still cooling off four and a half billion years after it formed. What we look at with the microwave receiver at six different channels that see six different depths is going to be six different temperatures. How far into the atmosphere we can see depends on what the atmosphere is made of and in particular water is a key element to affect that. So the depth and therefore the temperature that we see with each of those channels will depend in part on how much water is in the atmosphere. Then on top of that, we need the temperature profile of the atmosphere, how hot it is in the middle compared to the, the upper layers is affected by what it's made out of. And we can disentangle that both by looking at the six different channels and by looking at a wide range of angles because the way our orbit works, we cover the planet as we, as we go from latitude to latitude with a spinning spacecraft, we can look at any point in Jupiter's atmosphere from a wide range of angles. So now we have six channels and a whole range of different angles. We can do sort of a CAT scan to, to disentangle all of that and understand what the atmosphere is made out of and what the temperature profile looks like for Jupiter's atmosphere. So combine that with the infrared camera, the GERM instrument that tells us about the tops of the atmosphere and lets us to study the dynamics and the water in the upper layers of the atmosphere, and we can learn a whole lot more about this giant dynamic atmosphere that belongs to Jupiter. Jordan. Thanks, Steve. Fred Bagenal is one of the Juno co-investigators from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Fran. So as Scott said, Juno's special orbit over the poles gives us a really special view of the magnetosphere of Jupiter. And really what we can do is we can look down on the poles and observe the bright aurora and at the same time fly through the region where the particles that generate the aurora are accelerated and excited and then fly zooming down and bombard the atmosphere and uh, make it glow. So let's have the first uh, animation that shows you an idea of what we're really looking at. <laughs> 
we have this very bright aurora. Um, they are so bright that the energy that hits the polar regions of Jupiter is uh, coming from the auroral process is much stronger than all the sunlight uh, that comes from the sun and hits the atmosphere. So um, we're interested in these energetic particles that bombard the atmosphere, excite these aurora across the spectrum, not only in the visible region, but also all the way from X-rays through UV and then into uh, infrared and radio emissions. So all sorts of wavelengths we see emissions uh, coming from this polar region. Not only that, but the magnetic field of Jupiter is so strong that it extends beyond the orbits of the moons. So if the next animation, you'll see that the uh, big moons, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, all orbit Jupiter. And as they do so, they generate very strong electrical currents that go along the magnetic field and uh, send currents uh, and uh, particles into the atmosphere and produce spots of aurora associated with these moons moving through the magnetic field. Now, if we look at the next animation, I want to show, it's not really an animation, it's real movies taken by Hubble. These are pictures taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in the uh, UV part of the spectrum. And this was from a big campaign that John Clark and his colleagues at the University of uh, Boston University took with Hubble. And you can see various features. What we're doing is we're looking from the Earth and we're seeing Jupiter spin. Jupiter spins every 10 hours. We can see aurora come round into field of view. And you can see various kinds of aurora. You can see a fairly steady auroral ring. And uh, we don't know uh, exactly what causes that, but it's steady and doesn't change. Unlike the Earth's auroral ring, which changes with the solar wind buffeting an effect in the Earth's magnetosphere. You also see spots associated with those moons, and in fact, a long wake behind the spot uh, with the moon Io. Uh, and then in the inner part of the poles, uh, inside the mineral oval, we see all this bright, uh, dazzling, changing aurora, and we have no idea what causes that. It's a complete mystery. If we said that Jupiter was like the Earth, we'd say, oh, that's the solar wind buffeting and changing the magnetosphere as it, as it goes past the planet. But we have a feeling that things are very different at Jupiter. The magnetosphere of Jupiter is huge. It's vast. It extends about 100 times the size of the planet out uh, towards the sun. And so it sort of insulates the planet from the effect of the solar wind. So it's very different. We have some sense of what causes the aurora uh, from our ideas of the Earth. We have a sense from ideas of, of earlier flybys that were confined to the equator. But without flying over the poles, as Juno will do, we really don't understand the physics. So we're going to be flying a, a magnetic field instrument, Jack's magnetometer. We'll fly the waves instrument that measures electric fields. We'll measure particles, the energetic particles with JEDI, and the lower energy particles with JADE. Uh, and then we'll look down on the aurora and see with the UVS and the JIRAM instruments the glow that comes out when these particles hit the atmosphere. So we'll try and work out what on earth's going on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fran. <laughs> Candy Hansen is also one of the Juno co-investigators. She is from the Planetary Science Institute in Tucson. Candy. I'll be talking about JunoCam. I have a model right here. Uh, this camera's purpose, one of the main purposes, is to give the public, the general public, the chance to see what it's like to be a participant in a space mission. What does it take to operate a scientific instrument? Uh, so I'll talk about some of our challenges and how we're going to involve the public in this endeavor. Uh, the first uh, slide. This is the polar view that we will be getting with JunoCam, and the design of the instrument was driven by this view. We wanted to make sure that our images of the pole were as good as they could be. And so, for example, the field of view of the camera is 58 degrees across so that we could capture the whole thing. Um, the next uh, movie, uh, if we can bring up the movie, was actually a set of data, coll images collected by the Cassini spacecraft. The Cassini spacecraft flew by Jupiter in the year 2000 and in the equatorial plane. So uh, the images of the pole are quite oblique, even though this is a polar projection. 
So we're going to fill in that blank spot in the lower right there. Uh, and as you can see, it's also quite dynamic. The polar regions are quite dynamic. So we'll be able to see what the pole looks like and we'll see it as at a resolution and a viewing geometry far better than Cassini. Uh, we surpass Cassini resolution when we're about an hour away from closest approach. The, um, the next animation uh, shows what it would look like if you were riding along on the spacecraft looking at Jupiter through the JunoCam optics. And you can see, because we have our wide field of view, for most of the 11-day orbit, we're pretty far away and Jupiter's pretty tiny. Watch closely now, you'll see what happens in the plus and minus an hour around closest approach. So that's the key time frame. And um, we're going to have the public help us decide what images we should take when. The um, next still is, uh, these are two images that are, um, were <coughs> acquired by amateur astronomers. So the first step is that we are going to engage the amateur astronomy community to supply us with their data, send us their pictures. And uh, the image on the left was taken about a year ago. Uh, the astronomer's name is Damien Peach. The one on the right was taken about a week ago and it was acquired by Freddie Willems. And so we'll be reaching out to the amateur astronomy community so that we can see, because of the dynamic atmosphere, we need to see what is Jupiter doing in 2016, not what it's doing in 2011. Um, and then my uh, final slide shows, uh, after the images are acquired, there are a number of folks that process images as a hobby. and. Uh, there, we hope to engage that group. Uh, we will put our raw images out and we will invite the public to process that data. If we could return to this still just for a minute. Uh, this is a mosaic that was um, of the cloud tops. Maybe we can't go back. Um, the cloud tops around the great red spot. It was put together from Voyager images. Uh, by Bjorn Johnson. So these are just a couple of examples uh, of what we think we have in store with our partnership with the public. Thank you. Thank you, Candy. Before we take questions and answers, we're going to go back to Scott Bolton, the principal investigator from Southwest Research Institute. He's got some additional comments to make as part of uh, an announcement. Scott? Yeah, so I'm happy to make a, some special announcements here. Um, you know, we're carrying all these instruments that you heard uh, from our colleagues, and of course our primary goal is to get all this uh, new science data, um, bring it back to Earth, help us understand how we got here and what's going on, and uh, answer our children's questions. <laughs> and um, along that way, we also wanted to um, commemorate and take a little piece of, uh, of us uh, with uh, Jupiter. So there's a couple, two Jupiters. There's a couple of things on the spacecraft that I want to tell you about. Can I get the first uh, image? So this is a plaque honoring uh, Galileo um, from uh, his discoveries, and it's about the 400th anniversary. Juno's launching in 1611. There was uh, some people have celebrated Galileo's uh, 400th anniversary in 1610. From 1610, 400 years. But in fact, his discoveries were uh, spanned uh, many years, and of course, uh, he made a lot of very important contributions to our society. He was really the first that took a telescope, pointed it up at the sky, realized that he could do astrom astronomical. This is after he managed to sell the idea to a bunch of people that wanted to watch ships coming at him to attack. Um, got a little money and said, let's point it up. And, uh, and lo and behold, he saw Jupiter's moons. And in fact, the inscription on that plaque, this came from the Italian Space Agency, who you've heard uh, is one of our big partners, uh, probably the largest of the international partners. They contributed both the Juram infrared instrument as well as a, a, a major piece of our gravity experiment called the KAT. They developed this uh, commemorative uh, plaque uh, to honor Galileo. Uh, I think it's a great thing to keep going and, and help the public understand the contributions that this uh, great discovery during the Italian Renaissance brought to our society. Um, the re revelations that occurred from that discovery 
uh, are still with us. Uh, you know, first understanding that we are not the center, that in fact there were things going around uh, Jupiter, another planet, uh, certainly uh, affected all of us, both technologically as well as philosophically. The next one um, is a little bit in the same theme, but we're reaching out to a little bit younger audience. Um, NASA has a, a longstanding uh, partnership and, uh, with the Lego company. Um, any of you that have children know that Legos are uh, very popular with kids as well as really helps teach them about building and engineering and, and con conveniently uh, basically fits in with the whole STEM program I think very very well. So I was happy to be part of that partnership that NASA had started and you see on here three uh, Lego minifigures that are on board Juno. Um, they're made out of a special uh, space grade aluminum. They've gone through all the testing and to make sure that the, they fit on our spacecraft in, in a way that you know is like our other science instruments. Um, there's three figures. The figures that you see there, um, the one on the far right I'll uh, start with is actually Galileo holding his telescope and Jupiter. Um, uh, the next one is Juno which is, uh, is from Roman mythology, but uh, in fact Hera is the Greek myth mythological name. So that's Juno herself, uh, the wife and sister of Jupiter. And Jupiter resides just to the left in, in Greek, that's Zeus. And so you have both uh, Juno, Jupiter, and Galileo there. And uh, we hope that that will increase the awareness of children about the space program, get them interested. Um, there's a Lego uh, Build Your Future event that actually is going on at Kennedy as well during the time period of our launch. Uh, that's also happened during the, um, the shuttle launches recently. And um, I've personally witnessed kids uh, really getting into the engineering and, and building stuff. And so I think it's a great partnership and I'm happy to be part of it. And this will also help them to understand both the mythological uh, studies that went on, which are, of course also ancient Greek led to our uh, society as we see today, um, and also the contributions that Galileo made. So um, I think it fits with everything that we're doing and I um, hope you guys appreciate that. Thank you, Scott. We're going to take questions now. Once again, please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. We're going to, if we could, let's go to the back here first to Ken Kramer. Hi, Ken Kramer for Space Flight Magazine. For um, Scott and Toby, you talk about how um, looking at Jupiter will give us the ingredient list for how the uh, solar system formed. And Jupiter evolves over time also. So I'm wondering, how do you back out that effect to figure out the original ingredient list? Thanks. Well, actually, there isn't much evolution as far as the composition is concerned, because Jupiter is too small to have any nuclear energy going, in nuclear reactions going on in the center, the way the sun does. So once you've got something out there, it pretty much stays there. There's a little chemistry at the top. That's what makes those colors in the, in the bands. But down below, it's pretty much the way it always was. Yeah, I, I think I can add to that in the sense that Jupiter's gravity field is so powerful also that it's been able to hold on to its hydrogen and helium as far as we know. So, it, so its composition has remained, as Toby said, uh, pretty much intact. And what you're seeing is, is certainly a dynamic place, the atmospheric winds and so forth. But we're looking at the state of Jupiter. In fact, most of our experiments are all about that, about the, the basic state of Jupiter. Um, except for uh, what Fran talked about where the polar magnetosphere, which is a very dynamic place and you need to look at the time variability of that to understand it. I'll add one more footnote and that is that, that there is a change that occurs but it's on a microscopic <laughs> level and that's when Jupiter gets hit by a comet. But that's sort of like throwing a few s grains of sand into the ocean. It, uh, it happens but it doesn't really have much effect. Marcia. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press, for a couple questions for Dr. Bolton. Um, Jupiter is such a planet of superlatives, and I'm wondering if you could transfer that to Juno. How much better, how much greater is it going to be than all eight previous probes that have mostly just flown by, really? I mean, could you just sort of compare how much more this mission is going to offer than all eight previous ones put together? Well, let me, let me first say that they're all were great um, from my perspective. Um, each of the missions that we do uh, are providing unique and, and very important information for us to understand ourselves in the universe. Uh, 
Um, and very much uh, Juno is building on what we've learned from those previous uh, flybys as well as the Galileo uh, mission. So while, you know, I um, would like to say it's greater, I, you know, it's not really any greater. What it is is it's the, it's the next step. And so what it's, it's all of the questions that we've had uh, answered by the previous exploration have honed our, our knowledge and, and let us focus in on, on questions that remain that in some ways are very, very important now. We've, we've gotten clever enough to now know more specifically what we want to know about Jupiter to unravel the mysteries of the early solar system. Some of those early missions were reconnaissance almost, uh, where we're just getting our first looks. They were very important. They were outfitted in a way so that we could gather lots of different information so that we could figure out what are the right questions, what's left. And they essentially led us to ask the, the questions that we have uh, with Juno. And so um, Juno does, does more in certain areas, but it's because of the fact that we're riding on those previous missions. And so we, we, we look deeper, we go much closer, um, we're going over the pole, so we're doing a lot of new things that have never been done, and we're going to get all this brand new information. But in fact, it's only in the context of all the previous discoveries that it makes sense to us. And could, how big are those little quasi Lego figures? And where did those, you bur are they buried in the spacecraft somewhere? Where are they? They are uh, not buried. Um, they are under uh, protection of blankets, um, as is most of the spacecraft. If you look at it. So those photos were taken before we finalized everything. They're about an inch and a half. They basically are the size of the normal Lego minifigures that you'll see, but they're made out of aluminum, very special aluminum, um, and they've been prepared in a very special way. But they are basically the size of the, of the normal Lego minifigures that you would get through a kit if you were to buy Legos. They're all together right next to each other, uh, being friendly. <laughs> and they're and they're the they're the special passengers. Stefano. Yes, thank you, Stefano Coladano for Italian State Radio and TV. Um, I've noticed that the uh, parabolic antenna on the spacecraft doesn't really look like a, uh, a parabola. So, uh, is that a cover that is on top, and is that to protect it from uh, micrometeorites, or also from some magnetic? Uh, uh, I don't know, storm or <laughs> lightning that could happen around Jupiter? Uh, well, it's both protection, and but it is a, par a parabola underneath, and that's a cover over it. Yeah. And so um, it is for what? It's, uh, I'm not sure I remember now uh, all the details. We would, we've been, maybe Tim can answer that question for us more specifically. Yeah, it's a radome, it's a thermal blanket. If you look at um, a lot of the spacecraft that we fly, we put those over to keep the um, antenna from getting too cold, but um, also as a way to um, you know, protect it from micrometeoroids as well. I had the same question when I first saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as the, uh, the orbit, are you going to try to get as much data as you can as far as the spacecraft can go before being crushed? Uh, you mean on the at the on, last on the uh, orbit, yes, during the planetary orbit. protection maneuver? Is that what you're referring to? When you, when yeah. So what we we'll get all the <laughs> data that we can possibly get, um, and then uh, we haven't designed the last run during planetary protection. We dispose of the spacecraft in Jupiter. For those of you that just to know what he's uh, asking about, we dispose of it in order to make sure that it doesn't accidentally crash into Europa or some other moon, which we may want to explore later. We don't want to contaminate it. So. Um, the plans have not been completely set, except that we can deorbit and get and dispose of the spacecraft properly. Uh, we will certainly try to get the data all the way to the last possible moment, but it'll be limited by uh, the power available as well as the uh, the link. You know, we may not be completely Earth or Sun pointed during that time period. And one quick one: uh, I remember reading a few, well, I mean, actually several years ago, that uh, there are uh, light. There is lightning on on Jupiter that is. I don't know, billions of times uh, stronger than on Earth. Is that, uh, is that true? There's very, very powerful lightning on, on Jupiter. We know that. Uh, we've known it, I think, since Voyager. Voyager, yeah. yeah. 
So the wave instrument. The waves instrument. It's usually <laughs> detected using from the from the um, radio emissions that come off electrostatic discharges producing radio, and we'll be having the waves instrument. Will be. Um, we're listening for that as we go over. It's usually the mid latitudes um, uh, where the uh, storms are generated, and uh, I'm sure as we go over them, we'll be listening and trying to see um, whether or not those lightning uh, strikes are happening. Yeah. Here we've got a question on the phone, and then we'll come back here and take a couple of more. Uh, Claire Moskowitz. Somebody who wants to take it. I understand a lot of you have been uh, working on this mission for many years, and I wonder just what does it feel like to be now days away from launch? I'll let you guys take that because I've answered one right yeah, It's pretty wonderful. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what I'd say also is you got to kind of keep it in check. You can't stay excited for all of a five-year mission, and you can't stay nervous for all of a five-year mission, and for that matter, the, the uh, decade leading up to it. So it's exciting. And it's also kind of maintain an even keel and get this thing done right. And not get too nervous at the end. <laughs> right. <laughs> <coughs> All right, we'll come back here for a question. Uh, Leo Enright uh, with Irish Television. Uh, not to diminish the value of knowledge for the sake of knowledge, but uh, for a general audience, I was wondering, is there anything particularly maybe in the, in the uh, the microwave receiver uh, experiment that would contribute to our understanding of climate and weather uh, here on Earth and maybe also with the, uh, the aurora. Are, are, are there things from this mission that directly translate uh, to our own planet? I guess the way I would answer that is it depends how directly you want it to translate. It's certainly true that understanding <coughs> the weather on Jupiter will help us understand the weather on the Earth. I wouldn't say that I draw one-to-one -one correspondence and say if you understand this piece that will teach you about that piece on the Earth, but rather, as with any planetary comparison, understanding another example tells you a lot about the general process and how we can get it. And I wonder if Fran might want to come in a bit further. Um, yeah, I, I philosophically believe that you can't claim to understand one system or one, the underlying physics that controls one system if you only look at that one place. And so I think we really need to, to understand the processes that drive the aurora on Earth. I mean, we think we know how they all work, uh, but I don't think you really know until you take that same physics and apply it to a very different situation. And so that's what we're going to be doing with Juno, is to try and test our understanding by going somewhere else. Uh, if I may, just one follow-up uh, on the radiometric experiments that are being done for students. I wondered if, uh, if this is something that could actually contribute directly to the, the value of, of what you're doing, and whether it's something, since a lot of institutions around the world uh, like to listen to Jupiter, I wondered if, uh, if in fact, uh, people in Ireland and elsewhere uh, would actually be able to contribute uh, to the project, or whether this is really just uh, for the sake of it. I'd say the answer is yes. Um, I want to point out two things. Uh, one is we have a partnership with the Gavert Project, Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope, in which students use over the internet, they use a large radio telescope out at Goldstone to do observations of, among other things, observations of Jupiter. And we will use that data. That data has been already used a bit as one of the contributing factors to determining the radiation models at Jupiter. It's not the entire thing, but it's a, it's a contribution to that process. And now those observations are also going to be useful when we get to Jupiter with Juno and we're using the microwave receiver to observe the planet to understand the context. The radio emission from Jupiter's radiation belts, which can be seen from the ground, is a contributing background to the measurement we're trying to make. And it would be very helpful to understand when we're at Jupiter whether the emission that we see from those radiation belts is the same or completely different from what it's been days, months, or years previous. The, the, the students around the world using the Goldstone Apple Valley Radio Telescope are observing Jupiter day in and day out. So we'll be able to take their observations in 2016 and compare them to their observations today to see whether the context we're looking at is the same. Again, it's not an uh, essential contribution that we can't live without, but it's certainly a helpful piece of information we can gather. 
In addition to that, there's a program called Radio Jove in which people use uh, uh, lower, longer wavelength, lower frequency observations to look at Jupiter. And while that's not a direct contribution to Juno per se, my understanding is those observations as well contribute to our general knowledge of Jupiter and can be real observations, not just um, trying to duplicate something other people have done just for the, the sake of, of repeating it. Right here. Hi, um, Catherine Qualtrough with Kiwi Space Foundation. I just had a question about um, the core of Jupiter, um, determining whether or not um, Jupiter has a core of heavy elements. How definitively will, Jupiter, will Juno be able to do this? And what you mentioned measuring oxygen abundances, but I was wondering what, if there are other instruments like gravitational um, measurements that are also important to that. And if you can determine that, how how much will you be able to constrain the mass of that core? So um, first, I, I, I want to thank you for saying core of heavy elements. That was um, a key piece. So because I often say, you know, people ask about rocky core. And, uh, and while it may be solids and rocky, it's not like the rocks you have outside uh, on the Earth. It's, it would be very different under, under those great pressures. So um, that measurement is one that um, we make a very accurate gravitational field model uh, and we make measurements of that gravity field and we are able to say something about the distribution of matter inside Jupiter and whether there may be a, a discrete or, or sharp transition or is it just gradual and that will kind of give us the clues as to how much mass is in the middle versus uh, on the way out. Um, the interpretation of that data is uh, somewhat limited by our understanding of how hydrogen behaves at incredibly high pressures. They're much higher than the ones that we have here today. And so there's something called the equation of state, which is often studied uh, during time periods when people are doing fusion experiments and there's some fundamental physicists hanging around watching what happens at the point where these, this pellet of deuterium or whatever is, um, is bombarded and goes under this incredible pressure. And they get points on that equation of state. And as they make progress on that equation of state, we will be able to go back in and reinterpret Juno's gravitational field data because it will be further constrained. There's also um, a likelihood uh, or some probability that our measurements will actually make some uh, progress on our understanding of equation of state as well. So while we can constrain the core mass, that type of knowledge and how well we constrain it will constantly evolve as our knowledge of fundamental physics and this equation of state evolves. And so um, in that sense, that experiment will continue to become more and more precise as we learn more about nature. Um, the tie to oxygen is an important one. Toby mentioned it and he can uh, add to this, but um, the, the interior models of, of Jupiter have in them um, molecular envelopes and, and pressure moving down. And, and as we learn more about that oxygen abundance, since it's the third most abundant element, the, the, it will be the most, it's expected to be the most abundant of all the elements after helium in Jupiter. Um, that will help constrain that model of the interior uh, mass uh, and the, and the um, rotation inside. Um, along with that gravity field. And in fact, the magnetic field, as it goes through and we understand the metallic hydrogen, will also play a role. So all three of those come together to say something about the interior model. Do you want to add anything? I think uh, <coughs> one thing everybody ought to understand is we, we keep saying that oxygen is very abundant. It's a thousand times less abundant than the hydrogen, but it's the most abundant of the heavy, heavy elements. Then comes uh, carbon and then nitrogen. So when I talked about uh, oxygen combining with silicon and making rocks, the rocks go down, but as Scott is saying, when they get down toward the middle, the pressure is so enormous that you're really compressing things in a way that, that we don't understand yet. All right, we're going to take one question here from Todd, and then we'll have one, one more over here. Todd Halverson of Florida Today for whoever wants to field it. I'm wondering if someone can characterize the environment you expect the spacecraft to uh, encounter, particularly at closest approach, whether it's going to be quiescent, a smooth cruise, or dynamic, turbulent, how you would characterize it. And how are you going to manage to thread your way through the radiation belts without, um, you know, doing real harm to the spacecraft? 
Um, I guess that's for me. So the um, the spacecraft is outfitted with a with a titanium vault. There's a box in the middle of it that where we put our sensitive electronics, which would get um, eaten by high energy particles if we did not do that. So so we're sort of this armored tank going to Jupiter. And, um, and even with that, you know, we're avoiding the most intense radiation regions. Jupiter by far has the most hazardous region in the solar system other than just going to the sun and going into it. So um, it has its radiation belts around it. They're very much like the Van Allen radiation belts. We, except much more powerful, <laughs> much more hazardous. <coughs> now, so not only is our spacecraft designed to withstand the radiation that we have modeled and believe we uh, will encounter with, with margin, uh, of course. Um, we also are sort of threading the needle. We're going, there's a gap between the upper atmosphere and the uh, most intense part of the radiation belts. And we're going right between that gap when we come down through the poles. Over the poles, you're on what's called open field lines. The magnetic field is open and, and doesn't have a bunch of trapped uh, high energy p particles on them. And then as you get in closer to the lower latitudes, those trapped uh, particles are around. And so you go, you go between them and the atmosphere, there's a little gap, and we're threading that gap. And that gap uh, exists at the Earth as well. So we, we, it may be a, a feature of radiation belts in general, but we also have uh, direct evidence of that gap from Galileo, as well as um, radio maps of the radio emission coming from the radiation belts here on the Earth, particularly the VLA. And one final question right here. Yeah, my <coughs> name is, uh, Natasha Owen. I'm the Russian consul in Hawaii. And Scott uh, told us about the wonderful discoveries of Galileo. I would like to mention that one of the members of the science team, Toby Owen, discovered the rings of Jupiter. Thank you. It's nice to have applause from the audience, yes? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, See a couple of programming notes. Uh, first of all, our websites for more information on Jupiter, you can go to www.nasa.gov slash Juno or Missions Juno, that's one word, missionsjuno.swri.edu. And as far as uh, programming on our launch coverage, that starts at 9 a.m. Eastern Time on Friday morning. It will be on all three NASA TV channels and we'll conclude after spacecraft separation. And we will go out now with a live shot of Launch Complex 41. Thank you.